Here is the news and the weather and SOS broadcasts previously on the British Broadcasting Century. The very first BBC broadcast in November 1922 was the news. Well, in fact, it was the weather and then the news. On the last few episodes, we brought us up to late March of 1923, the end of the ideal home exhibition broadcasts. So now radio is being sold to the masses. What do the masses want from it? Just entertainment? Or perhaps this new medium could inform as well as educate and entertain? This time, broadcasting gains nightly weather along with the news, but also broadcasting becomes narrow casting, rather, aiming at just one person delivering important news to them via SOSs, which is sort of how broadcasting began. So we'll be thinking back this episode to the Titanic and its Marconi SOS from Professor Gabriel Balby. We'll also be looking to the present day with guests Professor Patrick Barwise and Peter York and their thoughts on today's BBC News and the attacks on it. Plus former BBC News producer Morris Blisson with Tales of Pebble Mill. I think this episode episode actually spans 1860 to 2023. That's about a century and a half, with news, weather and SOSs on this British broadcasting century. Hello, hello, this is Paul Carenza calling. This is London Calling. Hello, hello. Welcome. It's episode 66 of the British Broadcasting Century podcast. I'm Paul Carenza. Nothing to do with the BBC whatsoever. This is a solo run podcast. The bit by bit backstory of British broadcasting. And on this episode, that bit by bit has brought us to March the 26th, 1923. And here is the news. Well, here is the voice of the news. The very first voice of news on the BBC was the very first voice on the BBC, Arthur Burroughs. To hello, Marconi House, London, calling. To hello, Marconi House, Ah, London, a man calling. I played on stage to last hello, year Marconi in the first House broadcast show. Still available for touring, don't you know? And yeah, he was the first to bring news to the Beep. But pre-BBC, someone else brought us news on British radio. In early 1920, there was W.T. Ditcham. MZX calling... MZX calling. This is the Marconi valve transmitter at Chelmsford, England, testing on a wavelength of 2,800 metres. Ditcham and Round were mentioned back in episode two of this podcast, way back when. How are our signals coming in today? Can you hear us clearly? Ditcham's new service was arguably Britain's first programme title, nearly three years before there was a BBC. He was just reading the newspaper to test the signal. He could have been reading anything. In fact, a month earlier he was. Ditcham was reading railway timetables. I will now recite to you my usual collection of British railway stations for test purposes. The Great Northern Railway starts at King's Cross. The London and North Western Railway starts from... There, Minnesota. William Ditcham, the Britain's Railway first newsreader, is reenacting his own broadcasts 36 years later on BBC's Scrapbook programme, recorded in Chelmsford on the very spot where he first read the newspaper in 1920 and the railway timetables in 1919. St Pancras, the Great Western Railway from Paddington and so on and so on, till I was fed up. That <laughs> railway information was not so much meant to be useful for its audience, it was to see how far and of what quality speech could travel transmit. Let's go back even further then. A couple of years before that, it's wartime. Wireless transmissions aren't generally speech. They're Morse code. But news is still being sent out via wireless telegraph from the Marconi Company's Poldew station in Cornwall. A nightly news bulletin was sent out to naval and merchant ships at sea. And that bulletin was prepared by Arthur Burroughs, later first voice of the BBC. You see, Burroughs was the wireless press news editor during the First World War under the direction of the Naval Intelligence Department. And then he became Marconi's publicity director. And then after that, the BBC's first director of programmes and the first BBC newsreader. But yep, in the wartime, he's preparing news in Morse. Then later in 1920, he's demonstrating how news can be sent wirelessly to a bunch of journalists on a ship on the way to an imperial press conference. So Arthur Burroughs and news and wireless are intrinsically linked from the First World War onwards. There was no precedent, no store of experience to be tapped, no staff ready to hand with metal proved in a similar field. It was all left to us. Amazing how the same few names keep coming up, eh? In March 1923, Arthur Burroughs, as well as a few others, have been bringing us nightly news on the Beeb for four months. After 7pm, of course, 
do not want to annoy the press. Yeah, as we'll see in a couple of episodes' time, in April 1923, the BBC's relationship with the press was trickier than ever. There was an anti-BBC campaign launched in the Daily Express. Yes, an anti-BBC campaign in 1923, not 2023. Although perhaps both. To play it safe, then, the BBC deal was that they would leave all of the news gathering to press journalists and news agencies. The BBC would lease the news from Reuters and they would read what they were given. But here's a detail that I've only just read, actually, from Cecil Lewis's book, Broadcasting from Within. The BBC could request certain news items from Reuters. There was a level of interaction. I suppose the BBC were the ones getting letters from listeners, letters of complaint and suggestion. I doubt that anybody was writing to Reuters. So the broadcasters were then feeding back to the news agency what sort of news stories were going to go down well with listeners. Cecil Lewis's book goes on to explain what sort of stories they favoured, or indeed didn't favour. Reuters supply us with a certain amount of tabloid news twice each evening. This comes direct to us without any effort on our part, save that we request from time to time the inclusion of certain types of news which experience proves are of interest to our listeners. We strive as far as possible to avoid certain things, which are as readily or more fully obtained elsewhere, such things, for instance, as sensational murder details or unsavoury divorce cases. These things appeal strongly to the curiosity of certain types of people, but they can always be read in cold print. Reading, after all, is a private thing between the reader and the matter read. Many things, harmless-looking enough in print, sound very different read aloud. If you join us on Patreon, there are a dozen or more videos of me reading that entire book to you in time with lots of explanatory interruptions. The link is in the show notes if you'd like to sign up to those and hear more of Cecil Lewis's book, the first book on broadcasting. So that's the news, whether next, after a guest or two. Still to come, former news producer Morris Blisson, who worked in BBC News from the 1970s. But first, a short part of a chat that I had with Professor Patrick Barwise and Peter York. Their book is The War Against the BBC, how an unprecedented combination of hostile forces is destroying Britain's greatest cultural institution and why you should care. It's a fascinating book and a fascinating urgent cause, some could argue. Most of our discussion will be in three episodes time. We talk about the battle that the 1923 BBC had with the Daily Express and the Postmaster General of the day. But I asked Patrick and Peter their thoughts on the challenges facing today's BBC in terms of news coverage. How hostile are these forces? And and this is a genuine threat that you see? They're very, very hostile. And their hostility derives from three overlapping concerns. And those overlapping concerns will have been true back <clears throat> at the point of foundation. You will know that the BBC had to start without news because that would be interfering with commercial news providers and, and their flow of advertising, potentially. Mm. So there was that. So just to say that they were also not allowed to carry advertising at all. Mm. OK, so there, it was a double whammy. But in, in 1923, there was only one mass medium, and that was newspapers. <laughs> and so it was partly to protect their monopoly of news, but it was also to protect their monopoly of uh, mass media advertising as well. There was mm. posters and there were newspapers yeah. and they really didn't want this uh, big thing coming along. People who were constitutionally against, quotes the BBC, had three factors in common. One, they were free marketeers. They didn't believe, they don't believe in public service anything. Second, they saw a vast swathe of opportunity for themselves or their friends in commercial media, completely lost to profit, absolutely obscene. All those, all those listeners and viewers, and no <clears throat> profit being extracted. And then there was a third thing, which has developed more recently. Even such mild and careful scrutiny and criticism uh, as the BBC might offer to political actors mm. should be shut up. Mm. So every time now that anybody says anything that fundamentally touches a real red button um, in the Tory party, it, they get very cross and very threatened, which is why mm. there's a whole group of subjects which is never really covered by the BBC. They do token coverage wrapped away or on the website on page 99. 
but there are certain things they simply don't cover. And just to say that the those three sort of strands really run through, I think, the history of the BBC, like the lettering in a stick of rock. So the, the, the fact that there's an ideological objection, once, particularly once the BBC you know, becomes government-owned, um, continues today. We talk about the BBC. Actually, we're often just thinking of BBC news or current affairs, I suppose, in terms of, you know, I don't know if Dominic Cummings and like have a problem with BBC comedy and children's and music. Oh, and- yes. But oh, then yeah. do they? This is the thing. If, B- if the BBC weren't carrying news, would the government, would the press still have a problem with it? My guess is yes, in a different way. Yes, yes. Uh, but, yes. but less. But they would find woke people at work mm. to poison the minds of our children. Mm. Well, there's another thing. There's another thought experiment. Supposing the BBC wasn't the biggest and most trusted news source mm. in the UK. And we have... A, a, an interesting parallel, which is public broadcasting in America. The Republicans do not devote effort to attacking and undermining PBS mm, yeah. uh, and NPR. Mm. So the other sort of thought experiment you can do, supposing the BBC were vastly less successful, then we wouldn't have a war against the BBC. More from Patrick Barwise and Peter York in a few episodes time. A fascinating discussion that you will not want to miss. Their book is The War Against the BBC. It's highly recommended and I will link to in the show notes to a recent article they've written in the wake of the recent anti-BBC rhetoric. See what you make of it. So that's the news and now the weather. In our timeline, we are telling the moment-by-moment account of British Broadcasting's birth. We are up to March the 26th, 1923, the day of the first daily weather forecast. It was sandwiched in between the second evening news bulletin and a foxtrot. Now, there had been ad hoc weather reports up until that point on the BBC, but this is the first time that it's formalised and regular. Now, I guess there's a sense of reliability wanting to creep into the schedules. Can it be a coincidence that the day of the first daily weather forecast was the last day of the ideal home exhibition broadcasts. Well, maybe it is, but selling the idea of radio as the next must-have domestic appliance meant you needed some reliable, regular features. To make it a permanent fixture in the home, your radio set needed to produce more than just concerts and talks. There was a sense that people were tuning in to hear updates. The time, for example, although it would be another year or so until we got the pips. As for the weather then, the reports for the London area were phoned through to Marconi House from the Air Ministry just a few doors up at Ad Astral House. They had two reports each day, one at 4.15 and one at 9pm. The stations in other parts of the country often had their reports sent in Morse code. And indeed, it's in Morse code that the weather forecast had its origins, of course. Back in the 19th century even, the weather was one of the very first things to be sent out there. In Morse code, down cables in pre-wireless days. One of the first uses of mass audio communication. The Met Office was founded in 1854 under Robert Fitzroy. And six years later, 1860, he coined the term weather forecast as he gathered daily weather observations from across England and he would send them out to telegraph stations across the land. His earliest known weather report like this is September the 3rd, 1860. But that's dots and dashes and cables then. 63 years later, it's graduated to the human voice, broadcast wirelessly. So the news has been joined by the weather, and now we are joined by a guest who worked in BBC News for a third of a century. In 1975, Morris Blisson joined at Pebble Mill. I sat down with him for a chat in a rather noisy cafe, so do forgive us. Here is a delightful gent, Morris Blisson. So I'm delighted to welcome to the podcast now um, a man who's worked in broadcasting for many years in the news department and editing, uh, Morris Blisson. Hello, Morris. Greetings. Thank you for being here. You started in the early 1970s then? Yeah, 1974. And what was your way in to, uh, to the BBC? I worked on local newspapers. Then I freelanced as a journalist and I used to file stuff for the local BBC mm. newsroom, mm. which was then Birmingham, Purple Mill, in its infancy. So they took anything. Mm. And uh, when a number of jobs, permanent staff came up, yeah. I was asked if I wanted to apply and that was it Mm. and then they brought out evening programs like Midlands Today and Point West I became a 
the sub editor on one of those. It was actually before local radio even. We had skateboarding ducks and things oh, yeah, like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 yeah that was my friend Alan Towers. We were just jobbing journalists, really. We did whatever happens. We went along with the cameraman and, in fact, more than the cameraman, we used to go around. There used to be about five people mm. because we had a sound engineer, lights, two camera people mm. and the director and a reporter as well. So, mm. yeah, quite labour-intensive. Yeah. Well, th- then I moved from Pebble Mill okay. after a couple of years to London News right. Room, Breakfast News. I helped to set up. But we only set it up in a rush because ITV were going to do TVAM. Mm. So we thought we'd better get in first. Yeah, and we did by two weeks. Right. Oh, did you? Yeah. Okay. I know that there's different names that you've, you've worked with uh, over the years and back then. So some of these names, give, I've got a list here. Richard Baker and Angela Ripton, Sue Lawley, Moira Stewart. I think my favourite was Moira. I remember we went to uh, Ronnie Scott's one Saturday night, which was a nice night out. Yeah. And Jan Leeming, yeah. Peter Woods, Kenneth Kendall. So all these presenters then, you're, what, you're writing the news, you're working with them, you're editing. And what are the big news stories that stick out for you, the big moments that you remember? Well, in your notes here, you mentioned about the birth of Prince William, staking oh, yes, out the true. London hospital. Th- that's, that's right, yeah. yes. In those days, the 10 o'clock news was at 9 o'clock. Right, OK. So that, With a different name, I presume. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, was, it was called not the 9 o'clock news. Oh, OK, yeah, that's a different name. <laughs> no, they had a gap, they had an hour between the end of the nine o'clock news and the beginning of news news. Okay. So in that hour, the crews would unwind because they were all sitting outside the hospital mm. waiting to hear news. And I happened to be around during that hiatus. Suddenly Charles appeared, so I grabbed a microphone, stuck it under his nose, and he said, we are a father or something. Oh, yeah. And BBC One decided they would go live, and BBC Two decided they would as well. Oh, OK. So both channels broke in, news flag, and there I was, mm. standing there looking gormless, or more gormless <laughs> than usual, um, with a microphone. When you left in 2010, what was your role? Well, it was, I was always in news, but I was asked to help set up a new programme called Good Morning with Anne and Nick. Ah, yes. Which was Anne Diamond and Nick Owen. Pebble Mill decided they would have a programme with them, a daily programme. Mm. And they asked me to be planning editor. And I did that for three years with Nick, became good friends with him, uh, and still am. Mm. So what's the biggest changes you, did you see? Well, the miniaturism. I mean, the fact that you're recording this interview yeah, of course, yeah. on a mobile phone. Yes, yes. Which, is, which could be used to film it as well. Mm, of course, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, absolutely ridiculous yeah when you considered as i said earlier we had we used to have half a dozen people yeah well, i was thinking you said about a crew of, of five or whatever and yeah. i can't remember the last time i ever saw more than more than three people out on a film no, that's right. yeah. one of my jobs when i worked in birmingham was to look after any guests who might want to come in on the today program we would put them in a the studio make sure they're wired up down the line to do their interviews on whatever it was. This particular occasion, London had asked a Conservative trade unionist and he came in and sat down. I got through to London and the the London engineer said, OK, we'd just like to take a little bit for level. He said, I'd be very grateful if your guest would take his shirt off. And I, I said to the engineer, did you say he should take his shirt off? And the engineer said, yes, that's right, because I want to get some level, some sound. OK. And I said, well, why would he need to take his shirt off? <laughs> and he said, well, he's going to play the Marseillaise on his armpit. That's unusual. Yes, and I said, are you sure? There's a Conservative trade, yeah. right, OK, yeah. And the engineer said, oh, yes, I've got it down here. Here we are, look, Manchester. I said, no, this is Birmingham. <laughs> he said, oh, I do beg your pardon. And in fact, oh, they did have a man from Manchester yes. who played the Marseillaise on his armpit. Right. He was introduced by Brian Redhead and Brian, to his credit, actually said on air we had to apologise because our previous guest in Birmingham <laughs> thought that he was going to be doing this. It's like that moment when that fellow Guy Goma was dragged onto the BBC News Channel. I was there. You were there. I was oh, there. really? You were there for that? Oh, yes. That was a wonderful moment. I remember when the Dalai Lama did a broadcast. He came out and 
got into the green room and sat down, and a voice said, Taxi for Mr. Lama. <laughs> Let me thank you once again for joining us in the podcast. Uh, You're welcome. And your, your years of service, public service. Thank you, Morris. Thank you, Morris Blisson. Delightful to be in touch. If you've worked in broadcasting and have a tale to tell from your time there, paul at paulcarenza.com is how to reach me. So we've done the news and we've done weather. What next? That's the end of the weather forecast. But now here is an SOS message. Within a few days of the first daily weather forecasts, the SOS broadcasts began. It's for Dugan. Will Thomas Burns Dugan, last heard of eight months ago in the Birmingham area, go to the Glasgow Royal Infirmary, Glasgow, where his mother, Mrs Unity Dugan, is dangerously ill? Now, these lasted over 70 years and ran into the 1990s. It was an attempt to help people, except unlike DIY SOS, it doesn't send Nick Knowles and some builders around to build you a garden. It sends out info to listeners, or specifically to one listener. You just need to find them. The BBC's very first SOS was from the Birmingham station in March 1923 for a missing boy, gladly found. The messages were brief, usually consisting of an attempt to reach a family member of somebody critically ill, although other requests included a search for a wet nurse, or on one potentially comical occasion, a missing pelican. Reith ran with this idea, adopting it from the Birmingham station, and he helped forge this link with the emergency services to fuel these SOS messages with a bit of authority. Reith, of course, was never happier than when he was gaining links with authority in society. And, of course, it felt like an important public service. These SOS broadcasts are clearly a descendant of, although different from, the SOS messages at sea. Here is Professor Gabriel Balby on the SOS messages from Titanic, an early form of broadcasting. SOS are broadcasting services, we could say. So there is from one point, one boat which is in danger to the other boats close to, to, to this one. The Titanic is super important for for the Marconi company itself, because after the Titanic disaster, the Marconi company uh, was probably the company that most benefited in the world. Uh, because starting from the Titanic disaster, at the end of the day, there was an international law obliging boats uh, with more than 15 or 20 people, I don't remember, on board to have a wireless apparatus on board. So creating a kind of duopoly, because there were, at that time, there were two most important companies in the world, Telefunken and Marconi. So it was a monopoly, a duopoly uh, of the entire world of this service. SOS could be considered a form of early mm. broadcasting. A simple one, but it's a form of broadcast. You are scattering these messages out there, broadcast, not knowing who will pick up your message, but really, you just need it to reach that one person. So the BBC spin on this was, oddly, they're not broadcasting. It was potentially narrow casting. It was aiming at just one listener. You just had to find them. Will Harry Singer, a musician, last heard of two years ago in Rupert Street, London, and Mrs Bella Turner, last heard of two years ago in Derby, go to the Mildmay Mission Hospital, Austin Street, Bethnal Green, London, East 2, where their father, Goodman Singer, is dangerously ill. That is the end of the SOS message and of the news. But many other listeners heard it as well, and they wanted to know what happened next. But the BBC resisted the urge to follow up on any messages with updates. We would never know if that person was reached or not. That was a private matter, just for the family. It was using this very public means to reach a person with a private message. It's estimated that about a quarter of the messages that were looking for missing people were actually successful in finding them. That's not a bad hit rate, 25%. Reaching family members of ill or dying people would about half of those messages reached where they were intended. Unfortunately, reaching a quarter of missing persons clearly wasn't enough for the Beeb, so they stopped doing appeals for them, and they focused on where the hit rate was higher, reuniting family for those who were critically ill. Will Robert David Green, believed to be working in Manchester or Stockport, go at once to Bonchurch Road, Milton, Portsmouth, where his mother, Mrs Agnes May Green, is dangerously ill. Not all public service needed to be for everybody, of course. This was just about serving that one person. I wonder if another form of narrow casting as such could be the messages sent out around this time from PPE, Peter Pendleton Eckersley, the chief engineer of the BBC. This is London calling. Here is the chief engineer who's going to give you one of his technical talks. You see, he'd still occasionally muscle his way onto the airwaves, never shy in coming forward. Good evening, everybody. To preach and tell off listeners for misusing their sets in a way 
that was affecting the enjoyment of other radio users. Advisory messages like this one. There is a phenomenon of those who have uh, wireless uh, sets with valves called reaction, which causes uh, what is called oscillation. Now, the oscillation, which is manifest as uh, a note uh, of, of variable pitch and um, constant intensity, that note that you make as you tune in is heard by listeners around you for miles and miles around. Now, please, please, I implore you, do not interfere with the pleasure of others. Sometimes Eckersley would pick on individual areas where somebody was responsible. Arthur Burroughs did this as well, trying to isolate and pinpoint the exact cause of the problem. Don't do it. Please, uh, please, don't do it. Eckersley's wagging finger broadcasts on oscillating were legendary and a little annoying, it seems, as well. This is from Popular Wireless magazine, 31st of March, 1923. Captain P.B. Eckersley's chats from the London Broadcasting Station are always entertaining because he is a natural and gifted humorist, but I have heard it expressed that people are becoming just a little tired of his oscillation theme. Personally, I consider him at his funniest when dealing with naughty reactors, but I would not like to see him overdo it. When I meet people who remember those days, they always remember that cry of mine, please don't do it. Yes, listeners did not warm to being repeatedly told off, it seems. These messages aimed at just one or two people who are ruining it for everybody perhaps felt a little schoolmasterly, punishing the class when just a few were misbehaving. The dangers of narrow casting, then, you can alienate those who just want broadcasting. For them, not for others. Back in our timeline of late March 1923, Eckersley was also on the air, not just telling people off, but also doing some rather amusing tests, it seems. Our newspaper detective, Andrew Barker, spotted this in Amateur Wireless magazine, 31st of March 1923. It could have been no one else but our good friend from Rittle, who was testing microphones at 2LO the other morning. I want you to pay particular attention to the quality of the modulation, he told Jelmsford. I want to know if there are any whiskers when it comes through the loudspeaker. In fact, has it any of the characteristics? of the beaver. Right away, we're going to start test number one. Don't forget the whiskers. If you find any, save them, and I'll have them stuffed and eat them for my dinner. Hold tight, the whisker hunt is on. And then a little later, he said, hello, hello. Oh, that's too hello. Sorry, we'll have to stop for a bit. The piano player is tired and wants to rewind itself. We'll be on again in three minutes, but there is no reason why you shouldn't listen all the time if you want to. Don't forget those whiskers. I want a report of whiskers when I get home. He is surely a merry gentleman, and it should be said, Tuolo's new microphone has very few characteristics usually ascribed to the beaver. Yes, you can't keep a pioneering radio broadcaster down just waffling away as he tests their new microphones. A less humour-filled landmark moment of that week, March 30th, 1923, saw the first broadcast from a church. This was the St Matthew Passion by Bach from St Michael's Cornhill. Yes, it was a concert, not a service. But that was the first broadcast from a church. Now, there was a pre-BBC broadcast religious service, Dr Boone of Peckham. His pioneering broadcast is actually one that I'll be reenacting on stage this very week as this podcast goes out. I will be, of all places, at Butlin Skegness as part of a Christian festival uh, for the first time recreating Dr Boone's 1922 first religious broadcast. I'll be doing this again in Guildford on June the 24th and hopefully in London, maybe some other places too. Watch this space for the first religious broadcast cast reenacted but dr boone's church service was not broadcast from a church it was broadcast into a church from a factory five miles away so march the 30th 1923 stands as the first outside broadcast from a church building that concert of the saint matthew passion well it was easter there was talk in the wireless press, too, about the future of orchestral concerts. The two low orchestral concerts weren't exactly going down brilliantly in terms of their quality. And this comment was made in Popular Wireless magazine. Probably I shall be accused of being hard to please, but surely it's obvious that a good many people now using wireless sets would welcome one evening a week devoted to really good orchestral music. Take the success of the Queen's Hall Promenade Concerts. Third-rate stuff by a good orchestra, and Tuolo's orchestra is good, makes one inclined to switch off until it is over. Ah, yes, the proms. Well, there's an idea. That would come in within a few years. As for other innovations, Sheffield, which did not have its own station at this point, was leading the way with educational broadcasts. This is from the London Daily News, 22nd of March 1923. 
Radio in the schools. Educational experiment at Sheffield. Sheffield gave a lead to the rest of the country yesterday when the first demonstration of the educational possibilities of wireless was given in three city schools, two elementary, one secondary. In one case, the apparatus used was purchased by the subscriptions of teachers, scholars and friends. Speeches of Sir William Clegg, Chairman of the Education Committee, uh, by Lady Clegg and by Mr Percival Sharp, Director of Education, were broadcast, as well as lessons in history and a story from the Eiffel Tower. Mr F. Lloyd, Superintendent of the Sheffield Wireless Society, arranged the programme and conducted the transmission of the speeches from his own home in the city. Sheffield's BBC station and educational broadcasts for schools again would follow. Innovations all over the shop. Elsewhere across the country, the same day as that first daily weather report, March the 26th, 1923, Cardiff 5WA gained a new unorthodox station director, Major Arthur Corbett Smith. And he is such a character, he needs a whole episode of this podcast to himself. So next time, the tale of Arthur Corbett Smith, not to be missed. Thank you for listening then, and thank you to this episode's guests, Maurice Blisson, Professor Gabriel Balby, Professor Patrick Barwise, Peter York. More from that duo very soon. And for more on the SOS messages, there's a brilliant Radio 4 documentary produced by my pal Stuart Henderson, hosted by Eddie Mayer. The link to that is in the show notes. Well worth a listen. Thank you for listening and supporting, for rating and reviewing if you have done or if you might do. It all helps us reach people. And that is, of course, what the SOS messages did, after all, many years ago. That's the end of the SOS message and of the news. The British Broadcasting Century is presented and produced by me, Paul Carenza. It's nothing to do with the BBC at all, you know. Original music is by Will Farmer. Archive material is generally so old it's out of copyright. But BBC content is used with kind permission. BBC copyright content reproduced courtesy of the British Broadcasting Corporation. All rights are reserved. Stay informed, educated and entertained. Join us next time as we head back to Cardiff, March 1923, for the eccentric Arthur Corbett Smith on the British Broadcasting Century.